But our next guest yeah. will be making his seventh appearance. He's three away from a mug. Uh, he's also two Great. wins away from another national championship ah, in yeah. men's basketball. Bubba Cunningham, the athletics director at North Carolina. Uh, quick question here. Do you know anybody we can get some tickets from? Any tickets? <laughs> you got any tickets? Can you can you help a brother out with some tickets? I, I think so. I'm going to call Nina King over at Duke. I think she's got a bunch of and- <laughs> She's, she's always said that anything she could do to help me, she's more than willing to do. And she's, she's so reliable. So I'm going to give her a buzz for you. Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to end the same way, Wes. I, I think we're going to be thumbing a ride. Yeah. That's what we're going to be doing yeah. on this one. Uh, this is unbelievable hey. in some respects, isn't it? Uh, it is absolutely. Um, uh, it, it's been fantastic. You know, you, you hope and dream that this stuff happens. And I, I cannot express how excited I am for Hubert and for the team. And, you know, all he talks about is the team. He talks about he's had his day in the sun. And this is an opportunity for these kids to have those same experiences. But he's a first-time head coach. And for, for all of us to witness this with Hubert enjoying what he's doing, enjoying his imprint on these kids and these opportunities, it is really special. And uh, we're not taking it for granted. It's a, a unique experience to be going to the Final Four uh, with a first-time head coach. Um, it's not unique, but it certainly is rare. Bubba, we talked uh, with Nina King yesterday, and, of course, the chair of the Women's Basketball Committee. Uh, there's been, obviously, a ton of questions. Even though they had three ones and a two make it to the Final Four, you're on the Basketball Committee for the men. How difficult was this year from a seating process and now what we see coming to a finished product with all these blue bloods showing up in New Orleans? It was really a challenge. Um, you know, we, we felt like the, the top four were the top four. But as it played out, obviously only one of the top four made it to, um, to the championship, to the final four. And so that was unique. There were a couple of real outliers, and it's probably like that every year. We have two or three teams that – their net was really high, but you know we, the competition they played wasn't that significant, and so we didn't see them very high, but they did very well in the tournament, and others had really low nets, and then they did very well in the tournament. So it, it is a challenge each and every year. I do think the last three years have made it more complicated by not having a tournament, having a tournament in the bubble, and now having fans back and playing in multiple cities over multiple weekends, I think it, it was different um, for most people. You know, we have a, a fairly experienced team with Leakey and with uh, Armando, but they've never played in this environment. They haven't had to travel. Uh, Leakey has, he, but he's the only one. So it is new, and it's a new experience. And, um, and I could not be more pleased with, with how they've come through it and more excited for, for our fans and for the kids. Look, you've hired a lot of coaches, and you just mentioned it. I mean, the and Roy was with us yesterday from his porch and told us that, uh, you know, the uh, Hubert was t- – there were some bumps in the road here. I mean, there were some some shots being fired and things like that. I mean, but there's a maturation process. And, uh, you know, and I said this earlier in the show with Luke DeCock, I think there's a cautionary tale for the transition John Shire is going to go through, which actually adds another layer to the whole Duke Carolina thing Saturday night, Bubba. Duke's getting ready to go through what you just went through in terms of a guy who's been associated with the program for a length of time, taking over one of the proudest basketball traditions in the country. And there is an expectation that's built in about that. And Hubert, despite the the early setbacks, handled it beautifully by, and I think you hit this right on the head, keeping it about the team. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, when when Coach Williams called me last year and said that uh, he was going to retire – uh, the first person I talked to after that was Hubert. And I know Hubert was interested, but I said, Hubert, I'll tell you right now, my biggest concern is that you've not been a head coach. And I'll tell you right now, as I get into this search, I'm, my predisposition is to hire somebody with head coaching experience. Every single coach I've ever interviewed said, I've done everything the head coach does except call timeouts. And then they get the job and they realize, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And particularly at North Carolina. North Carolina basketball is an incredibly challenging job. Everyone expects you to win every single game. And you have to win some games by a big margin. But what the coaches don't realize is all of the time commitments that are required for the job. It is, you know, the basketball is one thing, but you have to recruit, make every decision about recruiting. You have to make every decision about where do you spend your time and how do you allocate your time. You have 
uh, development opportunities, you have media obligations, you have campus obligations, you have your own personal obligations to your family. All of those things are just 24 seven and that is probably the most underrated things that coaches think. They do think that transition. They all talk about, well, you know, as an assistant coach, I get to make suggestions. Now as a head coach, I make decisions. But they're making decisions in so many different areas that they do not anticipate. And mm. that really takes time to work your way through. And I thought he did a fantastic job doing that. And I think it's reflective of the personality of the team that's reflective of Hubert's personality. Well, I want to get back to the, the basketball committee for a second, just out of curiosity's sake. We always hear about all the, the elements that you tie in to try to figure out, hey, this team's a three because of the following reasons. This team's an eight seed because of the following reasons. You mentioned a net a second ago as a couple of the reference points. What are the most important aspects when trying to judge the quality of a team for the basketball committee? You know, Pac, it's a, it's a great question, and it's absolutely impossible to answer. Um, mm. We have a whole series of metrics. You know, you talk about quad one wins, quad two wins, quad four losses. You talk about the net. You talk about the conference strength of schedule. You talk about the non-conference strength of schedule. So we, we're overwhelmed with metrics. And so, and we have 12 people. And so I may value the net. Someone next to me may value the non-conference strength of schedule. Somebody else may value their offensive or defensive efficiency. And so all of us are then saying, well, we think this team should be in for the following reasons. And we, we have to debate that. And when you get down to those last couple of teams, it becomes a challenge. And then when you seed them, Again, what are you going to consider as the most important criteria for making this team a one versus a two or this team an eight versus a nine? And then it is amazing to me how many questions we get about, well, obviously you wanted to put this team in this region so they'd have this matchup or it, we never, ever even think about that or talk about it. What happens is we spend a lot of time. Who should be in the field is number one. Number two, how should we seed them? And then the bracketing almost takes care of itself because we do it geographically once you get through the, the top four seeds. So a lot of that, all the things that we talk about is just a, uh, a coincidence to how we seeded the teams going into the tournament. All right, uh, I'm gonna follow up and I want you to brag here, all right? I know you don't <laughs> like to do this, but I'm gonna put you in a position to brag a little bit with the committee. Give me an argument that took place with the committee in which you took a position and it turned out to be true based on what we saw in the tournament? <laughs> well, I thought that Carolina was underrated. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, can't be in the room. I, I, I can't be in the room when they discuss right, Carolina. Right. I, I will say that um, I, I know I'm biased, Cripes. How, how, are you, how are you not biased? But I felt like our league was underrated all year. I mm -hmm. think that uh, when, when you go through our league, even in a quote-unquote down year, and can win 15 games, 14 games, you've had a great year. And certainly you're not going to be perfect going through it. But, um, you know, that's one thing that I, I really did think that uh, right. we had a good league. And now getting a couple of the Final Four is really helpful. So, so you're not surprised at 13-3 and three heading to the Final Four? Oh, I did, uh, no, I, I, I'm surprised. I mean, I have to admit, I think we have a good league. And I had no idea how we would come out. I had no idea how the other teams would come out. Quite frankly, at the end of the ACC season, I thought the uh, Virginia Tech was our best team. They ran mm -hmm. through the ACC tournament. They were terrific. I, they, they have a, a great team. Um, but, you know, Wake Forest also had a great year as well. And, you know, they didn't get in the tournament. But they had a good NIT run. And uh, they're going to be a, a powerful team going forward. So the ACC is a great league, and we're just delighted we're here. We're delighted Carolina or uh, Duke is here as well, and um, we're looking forward to getting down to New Orleans. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go one more question about the committee here, just and I'm gonna give you a, a, an opportunity to tell me what you would say to this room. Uh, about five weeks from now, you're going to be at the spring meetings in Florida. And the basketball head basketball coaches on the men's side and the women's side, for that matter, are going to be in rooms. And I'm going to let you go in that room and tell them the number one thing they need to be cognizant of about their non-conference schedule. What would you say based on the committee experience? Well, I do think, and again, coaches really want that answer, and there's not a definitive answer, unfortunately. Sure. But you need number one, you need to win games. 
And so right. if, if you, and I think that, that gets caught up. So if you don't think you're going to be a strong team, I do think scheduling a little bit softer non-conference is important. I do think you need to be, you know, try to get around at least 500 in the ACC in your conference tournament. And then if you can play a couple of uh, MTEs and maybe get some Power Five or, not, or some of the uh, top net teams in a neutral site, I think that's very helpful. Okay. Again, you want to avoid bad losses and mm -hmm. get as many good wins as you can. And, and, and there's, there's not a science to it. And you have to kind of luck into it depending on what talent you have that particular year. Totally separate issue. And I always appreciate the time. Any new news? being whispered down the hallway regarding name, image, and likeness, and legislation, and guidelines? Or are we still as lost in the middle of the universe with this one as we were six months ago? Yeah, I think we are somewhat lost in the middle of the universe. I know the Senate's having some uh, discussions today. Uh, Senator Murphy's having some panel discussion today. I think everybody really understands the value of college sport in society. I think we're really trying to figure out what is the right distribution of revenue associated with college sports? NIL is a part of it. The transfer portal is a part of it, that freedom of movement. Um, and, and we're just working through that rather clumsily and awkwardly. Um, part of it is because we've got, we have so many legal challenges. So you have the judicial branch moving in one direction. You have the NCAA legislative process that moves quite slowly. And then you have the Congress with the potential for legislative action that would happen at the federal level. So all three of those are somewhat colliding, and it's probably going to take us two or three years to, to work through that. Um, again, people understand the value of college sports. Uh, the economics of college sports have changed so much in the last 20 to 30 years. What is the appropriate revenue distribution? And that's what we're struggling with. Bubba, can college sports as a whole survive two or three years without there being some kind of rule or regulation? I mean, I, I can't even imagine what we're going to look at if it stays basically status quo for another two or three years in that department. It will survive. I mean, there's too much investment in it. We've made too much investment. Other universities have made too much investment. The kids are here. It is, you know, we're providing half a million students the opportunity to go to college. There's $3 billion of financial aid associated at the NCAA mm -hmm. level. We are going to have college sports. Just We're just going to have to organize how we run, jump, swim, and play. It's going to happen. It will be clumsy. It'll be awkward. It'll be frustrating. But we'll have to figure out this new economic model. You know, will students become a different relationship to the university? Will there be some type of collective bargaining? Will there be federal legislation? Where will the courts take us? It just takes time to work through those. We're at a, a very critical time in, in higher ed and a critical time in college athletics, but it's not going to go away. It's just going to look a little bit different uh, five to ten years from now. All right, I want, I want to wrap uh, at least my portion of this on this thought. You're so good and you've done it at so many different places, but even in this time of upheaval in the collegiate landscape, do you still find yourself the pillars of facilities? coaching, academic enrichment, resources, all those things stay the same, even in the upheaval of name, image, and likeness and all this other stuff, I'm guessing. Absolutely. And, and I love it. And our chancellor, Kevin Guskowitz, sent out an email to the campus community prior to last weekend and said, you know, this is why we have sports. It is a, a way to build a sense of community, a sense of pride. It's our, our coaches teaching life lessons to our student athletes, our student body getting together, our university rallying behind something that's going on at the campus. And what we try to do in athletics is we want to support everybody else, whether it is what's going on with our Moorhead Kane scholars, what's going on in innovation and entrepreneurship. We're part of the fabric of this culture. That's what makes it unique in the United States and how we handle intercollegiate athletics embedded in the academy. We're struggling with that relationship, but it's critically important. We had over 7,000 students apply for the lottery for 700 tickets in New Orleans. We had over 8,000 uh, Rams Club members apply for tickets, and we had 3,000 of those for alumni and fans to go to the game. It is something that's very important to all of us. So we're, we're going to continue to work through it, 
And it's just, it's just fun to be a part of it. But fundamentally, and you hear Hubert talking about it, is we're providing educational opportunities for kids to come to the North Carolina to play a sport and have great experiences inside the classroom and outside. I fundamentally believe that. The economics of it, we're going to have to figure that out. Bubba, congratulations again on all your success. Tra uh, safe travels, and uh, just leave two at the front desk. And, uh, we'll be good to <laughs> go. We'll come by the hotel, scoop them up. <laughs> Thanks, man. Good Thanks to see you. Thanks, you guys. Can't, can't wait to see you guys down there. Looking forward yeah, to it. You, 